Hello, everyone, and welcome to Alec Public Affairs live stream. I'm joined today by a very special guest from Connecticut. He is Connecticut State Senator Eric. You say Berthel. Berthel. <laughs> I knew I was going to get that. Berthel. Right. He has been an elected official in Connecticut for, you just said, 12 years? Uh, eight years. Eight years. Eight years in the legislature and four years on the Board of Education. Okay, so. Yeah, so and about then, 12 years. You had it right. 12, and you have uh, a professional career as an educator in the. I, I have. Yeah. I've spent some time in the classroom, uh, and I currently work for a um, for-profit uh, private uh, institution of higher ed in Connecticut. Okay, and then here we have Andrew Handel. He is our task force director for education and workforce development. Thanks for being with us, Andrew. We appreciate all that you're doing. Um, education, of course, is just the issue that it seems to be dominating the news, and it has been really for the past couple of years sure. as we've come out of COVID. What is happening in Connecticut there? Well, you know, we had a, a very um, uh, disturbing situation that took place in uh, Koskop, which is a village within uh, the town of Greenwich, which most people know is uh, one of the most affluent communities in, in the United States. It's a you know, top five wealthiest town, uh, uh, top 10 in, in the nation, uh, where Project Veritas went in and uh, recorded a, uh, an assistant principal at the Koskop Elementary School who uh, very openly and proudly declared that he applies uh, systemic discrimination in the hiring of new teachers. Uh, anyone who is more than 30 years of age, anyone who presents with conservative or uh, right-leaning uh, thoughts, and anyone who is Catholic would not get past his desk um, and, uh, and get hired. And, and spoke to the reason why he was doing this, uh, goes on in, in great detail. Uh, and, and horrific detail that he's doing this so that uh, the progressive agenda can be continued uh, in, and continue to, to be perpetrated and, and brought forth in these schools. And, and, that, and then finishes up in this interview by saying, answering the, the reporter's question uh, of saying, well, do you have these kids will vote uh, more Democrat and more progressive as they become of age to vote. And he says, yes, that's absolutely the intent. So this is horrifying. And as the ranking member on the education committee uh, in the Connecticut state legislature, uh, uh, it's incumbent upon me to, to uh, bring light to this and to make sure that this is not uh, uh, something that's running rampant in our right. schools in Connecticut or really for that matter, anywhere. In the country. So how, how was it handled? How did the school board there and the department of education, did they, was there swift action taken against this individual? <laughs> Well, you know, uh, no, there was not. And what what happened instead, you would think that that thought leaders for education, right. uh, the commissioner of the State Department of Education, the president of the largest union that represents teachers and administrators in Connecticut, um, the attorney general for the state of Connecticut, the chief legal uh, executive, you think that the first thing that they would do would be to condemn right. what this man did. And then they can go on and say, hey, here's what we're going to do in response to this. Instead, we had uh, the attorney general uh, villainize the Project Veritas reporter by saying this is vigilante journalism. OK, well, you know, shows back in the old days, like 60 Minutes 2020, that was, you know, that was their bread. And that butter. was their bread and butter. That's what yeah. they did. Right. The uh, the commissioner of the State Department of Education said that uh, her office was going to investigate this to see if there might have been some professional misconduct. The man freely admits on videotape that he is applying specific characteristics to discriminate against hiring someone to be a teacher in this school system. How is that not very blatantly uh, professional misconduct? And I fully respect the due process under the law that you're right, innocent until proven guilty. Right, right, right. And then, of course, the uh, the union uh, the union leadership was really beyond the pale in this and saying uh, that, that not condemning it, but saying, hey, be careful, make sure you lock your doors, make sure you know who's in your meetings, make sure you vet reporters. So double down on caution, like you've got something to hide. Unbelievable. Unreal. Unbelievable, Unreal. Senator. And because here at ALEC, we are always focused on policy solutions. Sure. Like we want to present, there's a problem, clearly. And this is something that may not be necessarily unique to cost cop. I mean, other school districts may be experiencing problems similar to this. Sure. And that's why we're so happy to have Andrew here because 
Andrew, are there policy solutions that state lawmakers can use to address these types of issues? Yeah, yeah. Actually, just in uh, this past July at our annual meeting, we passed the uh, Academic Transparency Act on the Education Task Force, which I know uh, Senator Berthel is, is, uh, is a member of, and uh, requires curriculum materials to go online. It requires teacher training materials to go online, and it creates a private cause of action for uh, families who uh, are aggrieved by that. So, you know, it, it's it's a terrific model policy. And Senator, I'm, I'm curious, you know, how do models like this, you know, do you find them helpful? And you sure, know, how, are they, sure. how are they useful for, for parents? And yeah, very, very much so. And I think that uh, the bottom line with this type of policy, which is very well written and, and important, is transparency. And when, uh, when we have uh, building administrators, teachers, principals, superintendents who are hiding behind a lack of transparency, that's a problem because it, it, it's exemplified and, and drawn out when uh, when you see how an administrator is 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 doing what he did in Costco. So, I, you know, I think we should all, regardless of, of political affiliation, uh, anyone who's in in a uh, elected role and has the ability or a commissioner an appointed role has the ability to influence what's going on in our public school education should should proudly and easily support transparency. And, uh, you know, I would say that parents and grandparents and neighbors and aunts and uncles and older brothers and sisters who have uh, have loved ones who are in our public schools today, if you don't have that transparency and you're not getting the answers, you need to demand it. You need to go before your boards of ed. You need to go before uh, your superintendents in your public schools and demand it. Teachers across this great nation are good people. They can have their political biases. They can say and they can believe what they what they want in terms of their politics. But it is not their job to impart their politics mm -hmm. on the student. Their job is to teach young people to think critically and to make their own decisions, not to impart their viewpoint and their political agenda. And that's fundamentally wrong. Hopefully this legislation, uh, this model legislation that that offers all this transparency will uh, will make it very difficult for a teacher to do that going mm -hmm. forward. Are there any other model policies that I think are being picked up right now that lawmakers have really honed in on in the wake of all, all this, these new revelations coming out from our public schools? Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I think the other big one um, also passed at our July meeting is the Hope Scholarship Act, uh, yeah. which creates a, a universal ESA program. So, um, you know, parents, ESA again, education savings accounts. Yep. So, um, you know, regardless of what reason a parent might have, they might not be impressed with the quality of instruction that their children are getting. It might be that, you know, critical race theory is being taught or, um, you know, anything along those lines, regardless of the reason, anyone can access this scholarship account. They can take that, their tax money back and they can put it uh, towards a school that they think that best fits their, uh, their job. I, I think I hear people say they call it the backpack money or but, but whatever. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's uh, kind of like the money follows the student. Is yeah, that exactly? That's right. Yes. That's yeah. right. Yeah. And that's again that that is also good legislation that uh, that you know in some states that will will probably never happen because we have uh, we have uh, you know big labor that's involved that that's yeah. that's absolutely vehemently opposed to this because they lose control of the dollars at that point. Mm -hmm. uh, there are states across the country though that uh, I think will will adapt that legislation and uh, and truly give people the choice. You know, it's your it's your money at the end of the day that the money that you pay in taxes is your money. And you should have uh, have the ability to have a say in how it's spent, particularly in, with something that you know Thomas Jefferson promised us as 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 a as a nation, you know, 100 and whatever years ago, that uh, public school education was going to be guaranteed to anyone who stepped into the front door of a schoolhouse. And um, we need to take back control of that. We need to make sure that our children are not being indoctrinated, but they're instead they're being educated. And Senator, just this week here in Washington. We had President Joe Biden uh, celebrating, literally celebrating on the lawn of the White House the very day that our stock markets plunged to the lowest. It was the biggest drop in over two years. Right. And um, inflation numbers came in this week that were not good. Not at all. And I want to hear from you. Uh, what are you seeing in your neighborhood? The, the people that you represent in Connecticut. Is there a contrast between what is happening inside the Beltway and what's happening around the country? Yeah, I think it goes without saying, first of all, um, in, in the, I know we have a little bit of time left. The, uh, I think the president and his, his administration are completely out of touch with what's going on economically. 
Uh, we completely, the president completely ignores inflation and the economic disaster that is his administration and wants to talk about anything, anything else. But a very poignant and quick example in my own neighborhood in Connecticut, uh, I recently had a neighbor come up to me who I've known for a long time and, uh, and approached me with tears in his eyes and very uncomfortably uh, telling me that, that he and his family have to access a food bank for the first time because they can't afford to put enough food on their table to feed their family. So they're making a decision between paying for ridiculously expensive gasoline so they can get to work and earn a wage or keeping the lights on in their home versus putting food on the table. And that's the reality of this. And these are, these are people who are earning incomes, they're working, they're paying taxes. They're not people who are asking anything from the government. They're not looking for a handout. They're just trying to survive. And I think this is part of what is that assault on the middle class right now with this raging inflation and the cost of everything being higher than we've ever seen. And the financial markets responding to that with, as you just spoke to, the biggest crash in, 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 since Biden has taken office. Right, exactly. I think the, the, it was June of 2022 where we had a similar drop. That's right. That was coming on the heels of the complete sort of economic shutdown from right. COVID. That's right. So here we are, Biden's out there saying we're in a recovery, the economy's strong. It's, I think the reality for many Americans is very different. Yeah. You know, yeah. someone, someone gave, I, I think you're right. Someone gave me the analogy earlier today that I, that I had forgotten about. They said, it's kind of like uh, uh, rearranging the deck chairs on, on the Titanic. Right. You know, and I think people need to remember that election day is in 55 days on November 8th. And that is the best opportunity and the only opportunity really to affect change across the nation, the entire House of the U.S. House of Representatives, a third of the Senate. I think 44, um, 44 state legislatures are up for election, 80, 88 chambers across the country. This is the time to affect change, right. to make a difference and, and unelect the people that, that don't represent your values and elect people that do, that understand what America is built on and ingenuity okay, and smaller, less government and freedom. Yeah, yeah. Freedom. That's exactly right. We'll close on that. I'll just remind you that Alec is our three pillars are limited government. We have free markets and federalism. And if you're not familiar with the term federalism, that just refers to we believe that uh, this power should be returned to the states. Let the states decide. So those are the big pillars that Alec stands on. And we are appreciative of Senator. Thank you. Bert well. Yeah. I got it. Uh, being here with us today, and of course, Andrew, for everything he is doing. And if you want to learn more, obviously go to alec.org. You can check out our model policies, the ones we discussed today. We have a library on there of close to a thousand model policies that are open and available for anyone to view. So thanks for joining us today, and we'll see you next time on another Alec Public Affairs live stream. Thank you. 